June fifteenth, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Second Kings chapters twenty one and twenty two from the Old Testament. Manasseh was twelve years old when he became king. He reigned for fifty five years in Jerusalem. His mother was Hephzibah. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and committed the same horrible sins practiced by the nations whom the Lord drove out from before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He set up altars for Baal and made an Asherah pole just like King Ahab of Israel had done. He bowed down to all the stars in the sky and worshipped them. He built altars in the Lord's temple about which the Lord had said, Jerusalem will be my home. In the two courtyards of the Lord's temple, he built altars for all the stars in the sky. He passed his son through the fire and practiced divination and omen reading. He set up a ritual pit to conjure up underworld spirits and appointed magicians to supervise it. He did a great amount of evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. He put an idol of Asherah he had made in the temple about which the Lord had said to David and to his son Solomon, This temple in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, will be my permanent home. I will not make Israel again leave the land I gave to their ancestors, provided that they carefully obey all I commanded them, the whole law my servant Moses ordered them to obey. But they did not obey, and Manasseh misled them so that they sinned more than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed from before the Israelites. So the Lord announced through his servants the prophets, King Manasseh of Judah has committed horrible sins. He has sinned more than the Amorites before him and has encouraged Judah to sin by worshiping his disgusting idols. So this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I am about to bring disaster on Jerusalem and Judah. The news will reverberate in the ears of those who hear about it. I will destroy Jerusalem the same way I did Samaria and the dynasty of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem clean, just as one wipes a plate on both sides. I will abandon this last remaining tribe among my people and hand them over to their enemies. They will be plundered and robbed by all their enemies because they have done evil in my sight and have angered me from the time their ancestors left Egypt right up to this very day. Furthermore, Manasseh killed so many innocent people. He stained Jerusalem with their blood from end to end, in addition to encouraging Judah to sin by doing evil in the sight of the Lord. The rest of the events of Manasseh's reign and all his accomplishments as well as the sinful acts he committed, are recorded in the scroll called the Annals of the Kings of Judah. Manasseh passed away and was buried in his palace garden, the Garden of Uzzah, and his son Ammon replaced him as king. Ammon was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned for two years in Jerusalem. His mother was Meshulamith, the daughter of Herez, from Joppa. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, just like his father Manasseh had done. He followed in the footsteps of his father and worshipped and bowed down to the disgusting idols which his father had worshipped. He abandoned the Lord God of his ancestors and did not follow the Lord's instructions. Ammon's servants conspired against him and killed the king in his palace. The people of the land executed all those who had conspired against King Ammon, and they made his son, Josiah, king in his place. The rest of Ammon's accomplishments are recorded in the scroll called the Annals of the Kings of Judah. He was buried in his tomb in the gardens of Uzzah, and his son Josiah replaced him as king. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned for 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother was Jedida daughter of Adaya, from Bozkath. He did what the Lord approved and followed in his ancestor David's footsteps. He did not deviate to the right or the left. In the 18th year of King Josiah's reign, the king sent the scribe Shaphan, son of Azaliah, 
son of Meshulam, to the Lord's temple with these orders. Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, and have him melt down the silver that has been brought by the people to the Lord's temple and has been collected by the guards at the door. Have them hand it over to the construction foreman assigned to the Lord's temple. They, in turn, should pay the temple workers to repair it, including craftsmen, builders, and masons, and should buy wood and chiseled stone for the repair work. Do not audit the foreman who disperse the silver, for they are honest. Hilkiah, the high priest, informed Shaphan, the scribe, I found the lost scroll in the Lord's temple. Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan, and he read it. Shaphan the scribe went to the king and reported, Your servants melted down the silver in the temple and handed it over to the construction foreman assigned to the Lord's temple. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a scroll. Shaphan read it out loud before the king. When the king heard the words of the lost scroll, he tore his clothes. The king ordered Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, son of Shaphan, Akbor, son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah, the king's servant. Go seek an oracle from the Lord for me and the people, for all Judah. Find out about the words of the scroll that has been discovered. For the Lord's fury has been ignited against us. Because our ancestors have not obeyed the words of the scroll, by doing all that it instructs us to do. So Hilkiah the priest, Ahiakim, Akbor, Shaphan, and Isaiah went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shulam, son of Tikva, the son of Harris, the supervisor of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the Mishnah district. They stated their business and she said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Say this to the man who sent you to me. This is what the Lord says. I am about to bring disaster on this place and its residents, the details of which are recorded in the scroll which the king of Judah has read. This will happen because they have abandoned me and offered sacrifices to other gods, angering me with all the idols they had made. My anger will ignite against this place and will not be extinguished. Say this to the king of Judah, who sent you to seek an oracle from the Lord. This is what the Lord God of Israel says concerning the words you have heard. You displayed a sensitive spirit and humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard how I intended to make this place and its residents into an appalling example of an accursed people. You tore your clothes and wept before me, and I have heard you, says the Lord. Therefore, I will allow you to die and be buried in peace. You will not have to witness all the disaster I will bring on this place. Then they reported back to the king. God, each of these kings that we've been reading about in First and Second Kings all kind of have this specific order how old they were, they reigned for this long, who their mom was. And then at the end, it says, you can read the rest in the annals of and where they were buried and who replaced them. But I got to thinking after reading King after King after King, that it was so odd, especially back in that time where women weren't worth anything how it always makes mention of not only who his mother was, who the king's mother was, um, but her relationship, that she was the daughter of so-and-so. And I think that's really huge because in the rest of the Bible, any genealogy pieces almost always are man to, uh, to next man to next man. So f father to son to grandson. Uh, type of situation some uncles thrown in there but these talk about moms and I think about these kids who like Josiah who was eight years old when he became king and until he was 39 years old he ruled uh, in Jerusalem and here they are at such a young age having just lost their father and they're put on the throne to be in charge of everything
And I suspect that that's why we're seeing the mother part come in. Uh, there's not a male figure in these young men's lives or young boys' lives. And especially at that age, they usually want their mom anyways. And so I think it's really interesting, God, that you intentionally put the mothers in there right after the king's names. To watch over them, to care for them, to guide them. Um, for some of them to help them do bad, for some of them to help them do good uh, and follow in your path. But I, I do know through all this drama that it was you who was in control, whether it was a bad king or, king or a few of the good kings, whether the mom was helping the child or somebody else in court was, or an uncle, or even if there was an overthrow of the government. Throughout all of this drama, you were in charge and in control of everything that was happening. Um, you were fully aware of all of this. And I really need to remember this when, when the drama in my life swirls up so much that I have a hard time seeing reality. I have a hard time picking out the people who you have put around me, such as in this case, a mother, um, of picking out the good people <laughs> that you've sent to help me uh, and, and sifting through or having the discernment to sift through who those good people are and who the people are who are attacking me. It just seems like when drama happens, everything becomes clouded, everything becomes confusing, everything becomes, well, especially for girls, <laughs> very emotional. And it's kind of hard to see who has your back and who's going to put a knife in your back in some of those situations. So God, I need to remember that when the drama in my own life swirls around me, to keep my eyes on you, to keep focused on you, to keep focused on the plan you have for me, that going back and reading scriptures, uh, being on my knees praying to you, singing worship songs, all of those bring me back to the focus, bring me back to the place you want me to be to make all my decisions from. I, I know you don't want me to make decisions based upon anger and fear and frustration and pain. I know you want me to make decisions that are within your will. So I kind of go back to these kids who have just lost their father. They're devastated, upset. There's a lot of drama swirling around them in these courts, without a doubt. And they're so young to, to truly grasp what is going on. And, and yet with each of them, you've put a calming influence in his life, who is his mother the person that is his go-to person, the comfort person, the loving person. Although not all of those mothers were good people, you still intentionally put that person in their lives to make them feel safe in the area that they were at. And you do that for me, God. You are my safe place. You are the peace in my life. You are what I hold on to. You are my rock, as the Bible says. You are my rock when everything else around me is just squishy and um, melting away. You're the only thing I can hold on to. God, I thank you for that strength. That when I'm not able to stand on my own two feet and figure things out on my own, that, that you're just there and you're holding out your hand to me. And you have the words that just fill my heart with calmness. To set my path straight again. I thank you for that. In your son's name, I pray. Amen.